16 says that after Joshua, after Joshua died and before the kings, then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them, yet they did not listen to the judges. So there was a time that Israel didn't have kings, but uh, God had put judges in place to lead them. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, the book of Ruth focuses on an Israelite family, the family of Elimelech. That should be L-E-C-H. And we'll talk more about him. The author of the book of Ruth is unknown. The Jewish tradition points to Samuel as being the author of the book of Ruth. The theme of the book of Ruth is redemption. It occurs 23 times in the book. And it shows how God is working out his redemptive plan for salvation. Slide three, please. So definitions of some of the major characters in the book of Ruth. Naomi is a major character and the definitions of their names. Naomi means pleasant or fair. It means my delight. Uh, Mara is a character that Naomi gave herself. It means bitter. The Lord has dealt bitterly with me, she said. Uh, another character is Elimelech. Elimelech means my God is king. And incidentally, L, anytime you see L in a name, E-L, it's referring to God. Like El Shaddai is God is all sufficient. Elohim, God is our created. Elion, God is most high. El Roy, God sees everything. So anytime you see E-L in front of a word is referring to God. And the word Melech means king. So the definition of the name of Elimelech is my God is king. And then there are two brothers, Malon and, Kil and Kilion. Kilion, yeah, the C is pronounced as a K, I'm told. Uh, the definition of Malon is sickly or in invalid. In Invalid. I used to say invalid. I said, well, it, there's a difference between invalid and being an invalid. So, so uh, the definition of Marlon is sickly or invalid. And the definition of Killian is uh, wasting away. And I looked at those names. I said, wow, who would name their children sickly or invalid or wasting away? Those are not good definitions of uh, meanings of the name. So we have to be careful what, what we name our children, you know, because names, names carry a definition. I thought about the book of Hosea when God told Hosea to go ahead and marry that prostitute. And then she had three children and God named those children. He named them Jezreel and Lorohamu and Loamni. And God was prophesying through those names of those children that he was going to get the house of Jehu back because of what they did in Jezreel and that he would have no compassion on Israel and that at one time they will not be his people anymore. So God told Hosea to name those people that. So I wondered, I wondered who told Elimelech and Naomi to name them boys sickly and invalid and, waste, and wasting away. So another character is Ruth herself. Her name means friend or friendship. And uh, there's Orpah. The sister-in-law, her name means back of the neck or stiff neck, a fawn, a doe. It also means turn and walk away. And you'll see how the definitions of these characters play out in the story of Ruth. The definition of Boaz is strength and God-fearing. And then, of course, you'll have a son named Obed, and, and Obed means servant of the Lord. I think, I think Boaz knew what he was doing when he named his son servant of the Lord. And then I added one, Tov, T-O-V, uh, who is the uh, uh, brother of Elimelech. And if you see on this particular screen, it says Naomi represents the house of Judah and Ruth represents the house of Israel. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we, uh, as we get into it. But just to whet your appetite, after Solomon, uh, the nation of Israel was divided into two houses. And that's in the books of 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And they were divided into the house of Judah and the house of Israel. So in this story, and remember, I'm teaching from a Hebraic perspective. In this story, the Hebrew thought is that Naomi represents one of those houses and, and Ruth represents the other house. Slide four, please. We continue with definitions. 
we're going to talk about a kinsman redeemer. What is a kinsman redeemer? In Hebrew, the word is goel, and it means redeemer. It's someone usually the nearest relative who is charged with the duty of restoring the rights of another and avenging his wrongs in exchange for something. And there are three, it says two, but it should be three, three main responsibilities of a kinsman redeemer. One, to redeem the family property that had been changed, that had changed ownership. In other words, a kinsman redeemer could buy back property of a family member or a relative. Uh, another purpose of a kinsman redeemer, they were to marry a childless widow and raise children in her dead husband's name. And then uh, uh, the kinsman redeemer had the right or the responsibility to redeem or purchase back a relative who had been sold into slavery. Now, why is that important? It's important that we know all of this before we start reading Ruth. If we don't know what a kinsman redeemer is, if we don't know what the names of those people uh, represent, if we don't know some of the stuff that we've already looked at, that, that Ruth is going to be related to uh, King David and all of that, you know, just helps us to understand the story better. And then there's such a thing called the Leveret Law. Uh, it comes from the Latin word levere, meaning husband's brother. A widow should marry her dead husband's brother to prevent loss of property by marrying outside the clan. And that could be found in Deuteronomy 25. Five and six, it talks about the Leverite law and uh, the law of retribution and all of those laws are in uh, Deuteronomy. And, and what it says is, I'll go ahead and read it, Deuteronomy 25. It says, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no sons, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her Take her as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And verse six says, and it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So that was Israel's way of taking care of the widows to make sure that their husband's name are not blotted out of anything, of inheritance, of property, and even their seat in the courts. So that's good to know because we're going to see the Leverite law uh, into action in the story of Ruth. Slide five, please. The more tidbits about the story of Ruth. The story of Ruth is read by all Jews in synagogues, actually on the second day of Pentecost. And that is between first fruits and Pentecost. Uh, the Hebrew word is Shaviot. Remember, I told you that between Passover and Pentecost, there's 50 days. And so during that time, the book of Ruth is read. Uh, the book of Ruth is a picture of our covenant relationship with God and the blessings that are our inheritance. It's an example of the sovereignty of God caring for his people. And that's in Ruth chapter two. We're going to see that. The book of Ruth and Proverbs 31 are prayed over the women. Each Friday night at the Shabbat dinners, they pray those books over the women. And that's how they speak blessings of Ruth the blessings of Ruth and the blessings of the proverbial woman, Proverbs 31, uh, are pronounced over the women. Other themes of the book of Ruth, we'll see loyalty, we'll see obedience into play, we'll see reconciliation, and we'll see great faith by several of the characters. Okay, the book of Ruth illustrates the Mosaic law. We already talked about the Leverite law and uh, uh, other laws, and, and it'll show the rights of the foreigner and the blessings associated with walking in the commands of God. And I added two more. The story of Ruth is a picture of the Gentiles leaving their pagan gods to return to the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, remember, Ruth said, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And we'll see how that pans out in the story. The book of Ruth also shows in the genealogy that the Gentile blood was in the line of the one who became the savior of all mankind. And who is that? Jesus Christ, our Messiah. Uh, slide number six, please. Okay, this is an overview. The Moabites, the Moabites were closely related to the Israelites through the incestuous relationship between Lot, Abraham's nephew and his eldest daughter. 
Remember when God was going to burn down Sodom and Gomorrah and, and uh, Abraham had pleaded with him and Lot, uh, Lot lived in that area and God spared Lot because of the prayers and the cry of Abraham. So they were able to get out of there. Well, after he got out of there, his wife in, uh, turned into a pillar of salt. So he and his two daughters made it out of there. And then the Bible tells us in Genesis 19 that Lot's oldest daughter bore him a son. And his name was Moab, and he's the father of the Moabites. And then Lot's youngest daughter also bore him a son, and he was the father of the Ammonites. And those nations were at war with Israel. They were all, there was always contention. You know, if you don't lay the foundation right, expect some problems in the future. If, if a foundation is not based on God's teachings and instructions, expect that there's going to be cracks later on down the line. So the Moabites and the Ammonites, which were the descendants of Lot, they were always in, at, at, in odds with the children of Israel. And then there was the king of Moab. His name is King Eglon. He ruled over the Israelites for 18 years. That's in the book of Judges. That's a long time to succumb to the, the tyranny of another nation. So the God of Moab was Chemosh, and the children were used as burnt offerings, which in the book of Leviticus, God forbid that. He forbid the use of children to be used as burnt offerings and to offer the blood of these children to these idol gods. So all of this is saying Moab was not a Christian nation. You know, the foundation of Moab was rocky from the beginning and uh, it remained rocky. So according to the uh, uh, legend and le uh, rabbinical literature, which is called the Targum, Ruth was the daughter of the Moabite king, Eglon. Now, you may not see that in the Bible, but it's in, it's in rabbinical. It's in the, the, the books of the rabbis and the Targum. And uh, you all, I want you all to know that, you know, this is public knowledge too. They've made it, I've said that before, they've made it easy for us. A lot of people have done a lot of research and a lot of studying and written a lot of books. And now you can just go on Google and find what you're looking for. But I'm going to caution you, whatever you find on Google, you better double check it with the Holy Spirit and double check it with the Bible. <laughs> but according to rabbinical literature, Ruth was the daughter of the Moabite king, King Eglon. So what does that tell us of Ruth already? She wasn't a poor girl. You know, she was the daughter of a king. She was royalty, like, like Queen Esther had become. But she was, she was royalty. Okay, slide number seven, please. And this is where you pull out your Bibles. And the way I want to do this, as you follow me through the book of Ruth, I'm going to go fast. Y'all know me. So y'all y'all catch me. Catch me when you can. <laughs> I'm going to summarize because we don't have time to read all four chapters in 45 minutes. So I'm going to summarize the chapters, but I'm going to let you know what verse I'm at so you can follow me. Okay, Ruth chapter one, Naomi widowed. In verse one, in the days that the judges governed, there was a famine in the land of Bethlehem. Elimelech, Elimelech was a judge. He takes his wife, Naomi, and two sons, Marlon and Kilion. And y'all saw, saw what, their mean, what the meaning of their names are. He takes them to Moab. Uh, the two sons marry Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. Now, Ruth and Orpah were Gentile women. They were from the land of Moab. They were not Jewish. They were not Christians. They were, they were Gentiles. Uh, the man and his two sons die in the land. The rabbinical literature says because of their disobedience. The, the Targum says they transgress the memora or the word, the law of the Lord. And their ways were, and their days were cut off. That's what the rabbinical literature says, that they died early because they transgressed the law of the Lord. How did they do that? Well, it was against the law for them to marry outside of the clan, number one, and then outside of uh, the Jewish nation. They went totally out and married these Moabite women. So after 10 years, Naomi decides to move back to Bethlehem. Verse 7 and her two daughters with her. She tells them in verse eight, go each of you return to your mother's house, find rest in your husband's house. In other words, y'all go back home. 
Don't try, don't be trying to come with me. Go and find rest in, in your husband's house. You know, you'll find a husband if you go back to your own land. And then they cry to go with her. And she tells them, I'm too old to have a husband. And I don't have any sons to give you. And even if I did, would you wait for them to grow? And she said, no, my daughters, go back home. Uh, the Targum says the Lord remembered the prayers of Boaz. The reason why Naomi was going back to her land is because the land was not in famine anymore and Boaz had been praying. So the Targum, which is rabbinical literature, it says that the Lord remembered the prayers of Boaz and he relieved the famine from the land of Bethlehem. So Naomi was able to go back. And then in verse 13, she tells her daughters-in-law, it's harder for me than for you. <laughs> when I read that, I thought about, you know, when your mom would whip you, this hurts me more than it hurts you, you know. So she's going back to her land and the daughters-in-law wants to go with her. And she says, it's harder for me than it is for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone against me. In verse 14, Orpah kisses her mother-in-law and she goes back. But Ruth clings to her. In verse 15, Naomi says to Ruth, behold, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods, little G. Return after your sister-in-law. In verse 16, Ruth makes the ultimate loyalty statement that everybody can quote. You know, I want to go with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. You know, where you, where you die, I'll die, and, and, and all of that. And then Naomi allows Ruth to return to Bethlehem with her. And then so they return to Bethlehem, and the people are excited. Here comes Naomi. Is this Naomi? And Naomi says, verse 20, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. The Almighty has afflicted me. In verse 22, they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, if you remember when I taught the Passover, anytime you read about a barley harvest or a wheat harvest, know that the barley harvest is during Passover time and the wheat harvest is known for, for the Pentecost time. So it helps us to understand why during the time, during this time, the book of Ruth is read because she came back, they came back to the land of Israel uh, during the barley harvest and uh, during the um, uh, jubilee year, where where if you remember, if it's the year of jubilee, there's some privileges and advantages for a widow during the year of jubilee, or anybody that has lost land, anybody that has lost property, there's an advantage to them in the year of jubilee because that's the time for it to turn over. And you know what I thought of, Sister Ricky? You know how you get your uh, uh, your credit report. And uh, some people say after seven years, that stuff's supposed to drop off, you know, <laughs> uh, if you've got a credit, if you got a credit report or a credit statement, and there's some stuff on there from 1902 or whatever, 1995 or 200, know that after seven years, you can challenge them. And I wonder where they got that idea from. You know, <laughs> I believe it was instituted by God, the year of Jubilee after seven years, let the people go. You know, you've held them captive long enough. Let them go. So the barley season is passed over. Okay, that was chapter one. Now I'm going to run through chapter two. Turn your Bibles to chapter two of the book of Ruth, and then we're going to talk. In the book of Ruth, chapter two, Re, uh, Ruth gleans in Boaz's field. Uh, verse one, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, Elimelech, whose name was Boaz, a man of great wealth. And note, we looked up the definition of kinsman redeemer. Remember, a kinsman has a right to restore the rights of another and to redeem or purchase back relatives. Plus, it's Jubilee season. So verse two, Ruth asked Naomi permission to go glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I might find favor. And Naomi tells her to go. In verse, in verse three, she happens to come to the field of Boaz. Well, what a setup. Of all of the fields to glean from, she ends up in the field of Boaz. Verse three, uh, Boaz comes and checks on his workers and he noticed this Ruth. And so verse five, he asks the service, whose young woman is this? I wonder how he formed his words when he asked about the woman. Whose lady is this? Where did she come from? The Targum said, uh, he asked, what nation is she from? So there must have been something different about her looks that let Boaz know that this is not an Israelite woman. Who is she and where does she come from? In verse six, they replied, she's the Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. 
she has to glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. And she's been working all day. The Targan says she worked hard from the time she got there till the time she left. She only took a little break. In other words, she was a hard worker. Verse eight, Boaz tells Ruth, listen, my daughter, don't go glean in any other field. Stay here with my maid. I'll protect you. Verse nine, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. If you need, to, if you need a water break, Go get some water, but don't go in anyone else's fields. Don't you go anywhere else. Now, did, did, did you consider why did the uh, why did Boaz have to tell Ruth, uh, I've commanded my servants not to touch you? Okay, that's go, that's going to be open for discussion. In verse 10, she wanted to know why she had found favor in his sight. And Boaz, Boaz tells her, because of what you've done for your mother-in-law and how you left the land of your birth and came to a people you didn't even know. And Boaz said, it's all been reported to me. Well, I wonder how it got reported to you, Boaz. Were you snooping around and asking people questions about whose woman this is? No, Boaz was checking her out. So he knew her whole story. And uh, the Targum says that after Elimelech and Kilion and Molon, the, the, the man and the two sons died, Ruth and Oprah actually took Naomi in and they took care of her. They cared for her. So Boaz had the whole scoop. He knew the whole story of how they took care of her because she's a widow. Okay, uh, where am I? Uh, verse eight, Boaz tells Ruth, listen, my daughter, don't go glean another field. In verse 10, she wanted to know why she had found favor in Boaz's eyes. And Boaz said, oh, girl, I heard all about you. I already peeped you out. It's been reported to me, you know. In verse 14, he invites her to dinner, hey, with the reapers. and he, the Bible says, and he served her. Do y'all see that? Verse 14. And then in verse 15, he tells the reapers to let her continue to work. In fact, purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles and leave it so that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So Boaz was showing her favor and protecting her. So she worked all day. She came home in the evening and brought home some food for Naomi. Verse 19, Naomi asked her, where did you glean today, my daughter? And she says, in the field of Boaz, Naomi says, ah, y'all see that in your Bible? Ah. <laughs> so Naomi says, ah, the man is our relative. He is our closest relative. And so Ruth says, furthermore, he told me to stay close to his servants until they have fin and finished the harvest. And so Naomi tells her, you do just that. Stick with his maid so that others don't fall upon you. Do y'all see that in verse 22? Mm -hmm. So that others don't fall upon you in any field. So in verse 23, so she stayed with the workers of Boaz until the end of the barley and the wheat uh, harvest. So she worked through the Passover and through the Pentecost season. Okay, let's talk. Uh, we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to dialogue a little bit. Uh, let me, I'm going to give y'all five to seven minutes to talk about chapter one and talk about chapter two. What do you see in the characters uh, that we've talked about so far? What do you think about Elimelech's, Elimelech's decision to leave and to go to uh, Moab? What do you think about Naomi's leading and guidance of, the, uh, of, uh, of Ruth? Just, just, just let's talk. Who has a thought? I know y'all have thoughts. Y'all always have thoughts. <laughs> Well, I, I think that it was a bad idea for him to leave his own country, his own town of Bethlehem, the house of bread, and go to a place where he was told not to go in the first place, but it was against God. So it was a wrong decision, in my opinion. Okay, Sister Stevens, thank you for that thought. Anybody else have, she said it was wrong for him to leave. God didn't tell him to go there. Uh, because so I guess she's saying, I, I guess uh, she's saying that disobedience has consequences. Mm -hmm. Yes, it went all the way down the line. Mm -hmm. yep. 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 Disobedience has consequences. Amen. Yep. What, what do y'all think about Naomi and uh, and and Ruth? What do you think Naomi is getting ready to do? Do you do you see Naomi coaching Ruth in any kind of way? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, how, what do you think about Oprah, Orpah's uh, decision? Hi, Sister Charlotte, everybody else. What do you think about Orpah's decision?
Amen. I don't have any thoughts about Orpa, uh, uh, Sister Mary Jane. Um, well, I think Naomi must have been a very, maybe she, to me, she was a kind mother-in-law mm -hmm. for Ruth to want to continue taking care of her and going mm -hmm. with her. And Oprah, well, you know, she probably wasn't sure enough to to want to venture out of her territory. Mm -hmm. Probably felt better being with her own family than, than moving away. So, uh, you know, Ruth was was committed to her mother-in-law because she loved her. Mm -hmm. Apparently enough to leave her own family and continue with the mother-in-law and her husband being gone. So. To me, I think Ruth just knew what she was doing and wanted to pay back her mother-in-law for the love she gave her. And she saw, the, she saw the strength that her mother-in-law had uh -huh. to, to lose her husband, to lose her son, to lose, I mean, her sons, and then still be able to carry on. And I'm pretty sure she must have prayed sometimes during that time they were together alive and that, and that she had seen her serving the God that she knew. And they did not have that kind of God that they could serve. So I'm pretty sure she saw a good example in, you know, Naomi. You know, the very fact that they wanted to follow their mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. How many times have you heard, I'm so glad my mother-in-law yeah. don't live in the same city with me. <laughs> <laughs> so the very fact that they wanted to follow her, that speaks that volumes true. of the type of woman that she was, that they wanted to be with her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and then two elder gathers, as I look at that too, because Oprah, I think she was more comfortable. Sometimes we like to go back to what's familiar to yeah. us and yeah. what's comfortable to us. But as I dove into that, looked at it, I also wonder if Oprah's relationship with Naomi was as tight as Ruth's relationship, because see, Ruth had the most hesitance about leaving. She clung to uh, Naomi, whereas Oprah's like, Okay, I, I got it. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going back. So I thought about the difference in the relationships that they had. Not that right. Naomi wasn't a good mother in law to her, but maybe Oprah felt like I'll do better back in my own surroundings, serving my mm -hmm. own with my own people. Mm -hmm. And so she had an opportunity to flee back there and she took it. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. I want to. I just, I, I, sometimes I wonder too, because you see multiple versions of it in the scriptures. Sometimes you see Orpa asking, uh, Ruth and Ruth and Orpa asking to go with Naomi and Naomi saying, no, go back to your people. And a lot of people often look at Orpa and say, oh, she just, she just left her mother-in-law. She was just horrible. But I see it as at that moment, Orpa took an act of obedience by doing what her mother-in-law asked her to do, which was to return to her people. Now, Ruth decided to stay and Ruth, Ruth was disobedient right? in, in a different way, right? She, she just said, no, I'm not leaving you. And sometimes you got to have, you, you know, some of us are like that. We're going to say, no, I'm not leaving you. You're not going to tell me what to do right now. And it wound up working out in Ruth's favor. We know we don't know what happened to Orpa after she turned away. We just know that she went off into the sunset. And a lot of people go, oh, well, that's just the act of what, you know, a lot of people see that as an act of disobedience. But I, I looked at it multiple times. And I'm like, maybe she was doing what was right for her or for the sake of the story. Maybe that is what God wanted Orpa to do. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and well you can bet you can best believe that god is working out his divine plan amen. in this story and through amen. these characters amen. i want to share with you all briefly the way that it reads in the hebrew bible or rather in the targums which is okay. the, and what is the targum anyway the targum is a is a, a, a aramaic translation of the hebrew bible so let me read to you how it goes in in the hebrew bible it says uh, in uh, verse 16, Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you to go back from after you, for I desire to be a proselyte. Mm -hmm. That's how it reads in the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, for mm -hmm. I desire to be a proselyte. What's a proselyte? Someone that's leaving their religion to join uh, your religion. So mm -hmm. did Ruth recognize that her nation was, uh, and I'm just brainstorming, her nation was a, uh, a pagan na in nation, she said, I desire to go with you because I desire to be a proselyte. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, then, and then it says that there was more of a dialogue between Ruth and, and Naomi. Mm -hmm. So uh, Naomi says, we are commanded to keep Sabbaths and holy days such 
that we may not walk more than 2,000 cubits. So, so Naomi's trying to explain to Ruth what she's volunteering to come to. And Ruth says, wherever you go, I will go. Mm -hmm. And then Naomi says, we are commanded not to lodge with Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And then Ruth says, where you lodge, I will lodge. Mm -hmm. Then Naomi says, we are commanded to keep 613 commandments. And Ruth says, what your people keep, I will keep. And if they were my people to keep as if they were my people from before this. Naomi says, we are commanded not to worship foreign gods. And then Ruth says, your God will be my God. So that's the way it reads in the Targum. There's a lot of dialogue, you know, and, 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 and Ruth is persistent that this is what I want to do. And after, after a while, Naomi just, Come on, girl. No, no, no. <laughs> she said, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting a losing battle here. I'm not going to win this fight. That's what yeah. she said. Yeah. You know. And so, you know, Elder Gathers, too, when you said, when she said, your God will be my God, uh -huh. that makes me to believe that uh, Ruth was further into recognizing, like you said, that their people was worshiping the one and true God, mm. whereas I believe that Oprah had not quite been fully persuaded. Amen. You know, because it was too easy for her to go back. She probably was being obedient. And I do see it from that perspective, but it didn't, she didn't put up no fuss. She didn't put up mm -hmm. a fight. Yeah. It makes me believe that she wouldn't fully persuade it in the God that Ruth was serving yeah. to me when I was reading the scripture. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I was, looking, I was looking back at the notes and, and at the meaning of the people's names and Oprah, her me. Her, her name means turn and walk away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and um, Ruth means friendship and friend. Oh. And so we were noting how the, how the relationship between the mother-in-law and the two daughter-in-laws were. So whenever you kept calling that person's name, you were calling the meaning of their names. So yeah. that just struck me. Very good. Mm -hmm. What we're doing, what we're doing right now, there's a Hebrew, a Hebrew word called midrash, midrash, where you dialogue and you examine the scripture mm -hmm. and you read into it and out of the scripture, you know, because everything is not written. I believe it was John that says if everything had to be written, there wouldn't be a book uh, yeah. big enough to contain it. So yeah. it's okay. Discussion is good. Okay, yeah. so let's let's do chapter three and chapter four, and then we'll talk a little bit. Okay, and Elder Gathers, can I just share this? Because you did ask the question, why did Boaz have Ruth not go to any other fields? And I think uh -huh. that's important because from the beginning, it was set up that Boaz was a godly man. Mm -hmm. And in that day, because it said in the days that the judges ruled, he knew that not every man there was godly. So he was protecting her because mm -hmm. if she went, she could have gotten raped because mm -hmm. they not think about the same thing. So he was putting the hedge of protection said, you stay in this field because I know I'm a godly man. The people that I have serving under me, they know I'm a godly man and they know what not to do, but I cannot control anybody else's field. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a protection so that she would not get raped, that she would not get abused or anything. So he said, stay here. Mm -hmm. and, and Naomi told her the same thing, you know, so that no one will fall on you. So obviously there was a lot of hanky-panky going on in those fields, mm -hmm. men taking advantage of, of the women in those fields. So yes, he protected her and shielded her from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do Ruth chapter three. Boaz will redeem Ruth. In verse one, Naomi tells Ruth she's going to seek security for her and reminds her that Boaz is our kinsman. In verse three, she tells Ruth to wash herself and anoint yourself and put on your best rags, baby. Everybody is muted. We need to unmute Elder Gathers. Okay, go ahead, Elder Gathers. That lying devil trying to mute me. <laughs> okay, so in uh, verse three, uh, she tells Ruth to wash herself and anoint herself and put on her best clothes. And when he lies down to sleep tonight on his threshing floor, she tells Ruth to go and uncover his feet and lie down. So verse seven, Ruth does exactly what Naomi instructed. And verse nine, Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night and notices her. He says, who are you? Ruth says, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Now notice in uh, Hebraic teachings, when, when, when that happens, you're saying, in other words, Ruth is saying, I'm, I'm available for marriage. 
When a woman goes and lies down at the feet of a man and he covers her uh, in a, not in a sexual way, it's really a proposal for marriage. And verse 11, Boaz tells her, I will do for you whatever you ask for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. So he knew what type of woman uh, Ruth, Ruth was. In verse 12, Boaz tells her, yes, I am a close relative, but there's a relative closer than I. If he redeems you, good. But if not, I will redeem you. Well, uh, the Targums say that the, the name of that close relative is Tov, T-O-V. Verse 13, he tells her to lie down until morning. And the Bible says she laid at his feet. And the next morning, he gives her more barley. So verse 16, she gets home to Naomi. How did it go, my daughter? I wonder if Naomi slept at all that night. <laughs> How did it go, my daughter? Verse 17, Ruth tells her everything that happened. And she says, he gave me these six measures of barley and said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. I tell that to my sons-in-law. Don't you know the Bible says, don't come to your mother. What'd you bring me? Don't you know the Bible said, don't come to your mother-in-law empty-handed, you know. <laughs> So uh, verse 17, Ruth tells her all that happened. And he gave me these six loaves of barley uh, and, and said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Mm -hmm. Verse 18, Naomi tells her to wait until he settles the matter. She says, uh, for the man will not rest until he settles it today. Okay, let's look at chapter four and then we'll talk. Chapter four, the marriage of Ruth. Verse one, so Boaz goes to the gate and he sits down there. Uh, no, and, and when it says that he goes to the gate, I believe Sister uh, Ricky said something about that. Uh, Boaz is in a position of authority, but for anyone to go and sit at the gate, I want you to know that that's like a courthouse. That's the gate of the Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. So he's a judge. He's in a position of authority. And so is uh, this guy told that that kind of outranks him as far as getting the inheritance or buying back the, the inheritance is concerned. So in verse two, he took 10 men of the elders of the city. And remember when we studied numbers, numerology, uh, the number 10 is completeness and divine order. The number 10 also means perfection. In the Jewish circle, it takes 10 men to hold a religious ceremony or a liturgical mm -hmm. purposes. So the elders acted as judges and arbitrators. So, so uh, Boaz takes 10 of those men. Verse three, Boaz offers his relative Tov the right to redeem Naomi's property. Naomi, who has come back from Moab, has, a, has to sell a piece of land which belonged to our brother Eliminate. Now, uh, my Bible says Naomi has to sell a piece of land. Some Bible says uh, Naomi is selling a piece of land. And then some of the commentary says Naomi has sold a piece of land. But anyway, the land had belonged to Naomi and her sons and the land, and it's the year of Jubilee but it's not in, in Naomi's hands because she's, uh, you know, she's, a, she's a widow. So the land is not in her hands. Oh, so God. verse three, Bo Boaz offers his relative Tob the right to redeem Naomi's property. Naomi who has come back from Moab has to sell a piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. Um, she, uh, the rabbinical literature said she had sold the property while she was in poverty. However, since it's a Jubilee year, her property could be bought back according to the Mosaic law. And that Mosaic law, the law of redemption is in Leviticus 25. Verse four, the relative says, I will redeem it. Verse five, Boaz throws a curveball on him. He says, on the day that you buy the land, you also acquire Ruth to raise up the name of the deceased. Her, her deceased husband was Marlon on his inheritance. And verse six, the relative declines. I can't do that. I will jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it yourself. So he takes this sandal off as confirmation. In, 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 in Hebrew school of thought, when a person takes his sandals off and hands it to you, or if they take the right glove off their hand and, and, and hand it to you, uh, it's confirmation that what, what they're saying, it's like pinky finger, pinky swear. You know how we used to do when we were kids, <laughs> pinky swear. That means my word is truth, my word is bond, I stand by my, my, my word, I'm confirming my, my oath to you, I'm confirming my word to you. So um, verse nine, Boaz tells the elders, you are my witnesses, he doesn't want it. He doesn't want it, so I bought it from Naomi, all that 
belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Kilion and Marlon. Verse 10, moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Marlon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. You are my witnesses so that the name of the dead will not be cut off. Verse 11 and 12, the elders pronounce blessings on Ruth, the blessings of Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. They pronounce blessings on the house of Boaz and Ruth and their future offsprings. In verse 13, Bo uh, Bo we see that Boaz married Ruth and she conceived and had a son, Obed, and Naomi gets to be the nanny. Uh, the, you know, the Hebrew Bible actually said and Naomi, Naomi became the nanny. I said, well, y'all were using that word then. Okay. <laughs> so so uh, they pronounce blessings on Naomi. The women pronounce blessings on Naomi as well. In verse 16, the line of David begins. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. Uh, that's in Matthew chapter one also, the genealogy. 14 generations later from the lineage of David, who do we get? Christ, our King, the Messiah. Okay, let's talk about chapter three and four. What are your thoughts? Uh, is uh, Boaz, first of all, let me just bring out that according to Jewish law, Boaz couldn't just arbitrarily buy the land because uh, Tov and the rabbinical literature tells us that Elimelech and Tov and Boaz's father, Salmon, S-A-L-M-O-N, those three were brothers. So, so Tov, the kinsman redeemer, he was next in line because Boaz would have been a nephew, whereas Tov is a brother to eliminate. So, so Tov had the right first. He had to go through Tov in it before he can purchase the land. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think about Tov? You know, at first when Boaz says, you know, you can purchase the land because you're next in line and Tov said, I'll buy the land. And then Boaz, said, uh, uh, Boaz says, well, you have to acquire uh, Naomi and Ruth also. And Tov says, I don't want the land. <laughs> <laughs> well, can y'all midrash and, 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 and talk about what's going on here? What's, what's, what's going on here? Yeah. So he, see, he had his eye on the property. He had his eye on, <laughs> on the wealth. But he didn't want to assume the relationship or the ownership or the responsibility for the person. He was just looking at that personal gain at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And he missed a real blessing yeah. because the blessing was in the women themselves. And mm. you know, it's just sometimes we look at we we look at some things and we we forget to look at others and we miss out on what we really should have been looking at. So I think that was a mistake on his part. Yeah, now now, uh, let me just speculate for a little while. If he was to purchase the land and he's thinking, I'm gonna get Naomi, I'm okay with that because Naomi can't have no children. Mm -hmm. Remember she told her daughters-in-law, I can't even mm -hmm. have children anymore. So if he was okay with purchasing the land and getting Naomi, yeah, nice. knowing that Naomi couldn't have any children, because what happens What happens to the land? Let's just say Naomi could have children and he purchased the land and got Naomi. Whose land, whose property would, uh, who, whose property would it be? It didn't go to the Naomi's children. It would go to the children. It wouldn't be his yeah. because the name of, 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 of the husband, Elimelech, had to be preserved. And not only did the name have to be preserved, the seat at the gate with the Sanhedrin, the seat among the judges would fall to Naomi's children. But in this case, Naomi cannot have any children. So when he finds out, so Boab, Boaz whips out uh, Deuteronomy 25 on him. It's not just about Naomi. You got to acquire Ruth too. Because Ruth's two sons, remember the land belongs to Elimelech, and it goes down to the two sons, mm -hmm. but the two sons are dead, mm -hmm. but the wives are not dead. So mm -hmm. if the le so if so now Tov is seeing if he marries Ruth, then what happens if Ruth has children? Mm -hmm. Right, he would, everything he would everything to goes to the oh, children. So that's children. where he lost the blessing because he lost the lineage that could yeah. lead to the King of Kings who owned it all. And that's what I was saying about his missing the blessing because when when Ruth had the children, those children that boy Obed led to the lineage of Jesus Christ. 
you know, and so he missed out on the really great blessing. Okay, uh, the, the uh, rabbinical literature also says that Boaz knew the character of Tov. Mm -hmm. Yes. Tov was not the fairest of 10,000. <laughs> you know, he, he, he wasn't a Boaz. Boaz was a, a rich man. Let's talk about Boaz being a rich man. Yes. Yeah. Why didn't Boaz care that if Ruth had children, the land would go to Ruth's children? Because he had it already. He, had, he was already wealthy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and here's another thing that Tov wasn't looking at, and it shows the selfishness of Tov, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Boaz can easily say, so what if mm -hmm. the land goes to Ruth's children? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. guess what? Yeah, yeah. Ruth's children are what? Mm -hmm. Are my not children. Family. Yeah, that's it. So, so it shows the selfishness of Tov and that he was okay with buying the land. And then Tov says, I cannot buy that land because it's going to mess up my inheritance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, do, how, do you, how do you think it would mess up his inheritance? Well, well, well let, let me tell you what the Targum because, says, because the Targum says more than our Bible says. The Targum says that Tov said, I already have a wife mm. and, 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 and children. And mm -hmm. if I bring another wife into the equation, and have to give that wife the inheritance, that's gonna mess up what I already have. Mm -hmm. And the Targum says, he told Boaz, you marry her, you don't even have a wife. <laughs> so, so Boaz was not only rich, Boaz was a godly man, Boaz was a praying man, Boaz sat among uh, the, 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 the court of government, the seat of government, and Boaz was not selfish, because like Sister Ricky said, he already had him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He already had his, so it didn't matter to him that if he married Ruth and Ruth had children, that the property and the land and then even the name of Malon would be preserved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Gathers, yes, um, ma'am. I love that you brought up the Targum and the, the dialogue that happens because that's what we see in the movies where they do the Bible movies. And there's there's this one part, I can't remember which title film it is, but there is that one part where where Boaz tells Ruth before before any of this happens, he tells her not to go in the fields, just like we were talking about earlier. But mm -hmm. he specifically tells her not to go into Tove's fields. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> At one point in the movies, it, it, I can't remember which movie it was, long time ago to me, and he specifically tells her not to go into his fields because there's just something not right about what's going on over there. And then the part where the part where they get into the conversation about who's going to get to marry, you know, who gets to marry Ruth the the it's sort of like Tove says but if I have but if her but if her heirs are not my heirs then whose heirs are they mm -hmm. he's like he's confused he also does not know the law mm -hmm. he just he's getting all of this broken down to him by the cedar tin and he's like oh no but he had already had his eye on the property that belonged to Elimelech and he was trying to figure out and, he, and in the movie he's like sneaking around trying to figure out how he can purchase it and yeah. this whole situation with Ruth just happens to work out in Boaz's favor because mm -hmm. she likes him yeah he likes her mm -hmm. and it's going to work out versus what Tov was, was going to try to do which was Naomi's in dire straits let me buy the property for from her and then she can become my servant that's mm -hmm. what Tov was trying to do Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I didn't see the movie, Sister Charlotte, but I know one thing about movies. If mm -hmm. they can't figure it out by reading the Bible, they'll make stuff up and they'll they'll fill in the gaps. You know, <laughs> yeah. if there's a gap, if if there's a gap, they'll fill it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, it's just really weird that the, the speculation that goes into that really makes you wonder what is this guy's real motivation? Oh, and uh -huh. and I saw that I was like that when you were bringing the, the the conversation up earlier that dialogue that's missing I'm like I wonder if that's where they got it from anyway yeah <laughs> well thanks Charlotte for that for, the, for those thoughts so um well anybody else have any thoughts on chapter three and four I was going to add, you know, with the chapter three, I love the way that the premises is already being set up and um, it, it, this, the analogy of it, because not only was it talking about Ruth, especially in verse three, there are three things that is very significant, and that is wash yourself. 
Mm -hmm. Meaning that she's going to get herself cleaned up. All right. Mm -hmm. Anoint yourself. Mm-hmm. And then the, the, la- the last one is put on your best Let clothes. Me, look, so, go on over there and sit in the chair. Okay, so the three things that's talking about Ruth there, that's our relationship with God. We have to get ourselves in a position to be presented. We can't, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Something's up with your mic, Sister Ricky. Open to that is uh, kind of interfering. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, awesome. So I'll just kind of repeat. I said there's three things that are happening in verse number three that I think sets the whole premise of what's going to transpire all the way through uh, chapter four. And that is wash yourself. That's the first thing that Ruth had to do. And then anoint herself, mm-hmm. meaning enabling yourself to be ready to be received in the Holy Spirit. But Naomi was telling her that so she can be received by Boaz. And then put on your best clothes. When we go before the Lord, we need to be dressed pretty for the Lord, not just mm-hmm. into, into his presence any kind of way. And so that because the eye is the thing that pleases us, that's what draws us in. And so even for us us entering into the presence of the Lord, we need to have ourselves drunk in the best clothing that we can present ourselves. So I love the way that this is where Naomi's wisdom really comes out. You know, mm-hmm. somebody might say that they was concocting a cunning plan <laughs> or whatever, but she did what she had to do because she knew the law. She knew what it was and she was still mentoring uh, uh, Ruth on what to do. And mm-hmm. so when she told her those things in the th- in verse three, I thought that that was the most, uh, it, it really spoke to my spirit because mm-hmm. I'm saying not only is she mentoring her to do that, but that's what the Lord is telling us that we need to do mm-hmm. in order to be in his presence so that we can reap those rewards and benefits just like Ruth did from Boaz. Mm-hmm. Amen. And Amen. I like what happened uh, with Ruth, I mean, with Naomi and how she was turned from that now bitter woman. She was turned into that blessed woman who life is restored to by holding. She said, in four, I think it's in 14, that she said that God has restored life to me. And mm-hmm. now I have this son, you know, and I can uh, be happy again. I can be the, the Naomi that I was made to be, that, that mm-hmm. one that was joyous. Amen. And- I, I believe, and that's why some people say the story should be about Naomi. Well, it is about Naomi, but it's, yeah. also, it's also about Ruth. Because yeah. as we said in the beginning, the story is all about loyalty and obedience too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what if Ruth had not listened to Naomi? And mm-hmm. Naomi knew, even though through the whole story, there's really no conversation. There's not, there's not even sight of mm-hmm. Naomi uh, and Boaz. The, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in the story, Naomi doesn't see Boaz and, and, and doesn't speak with him, but she knows who he is mm-hmm. because when, when, when Ruth mentioned his name, she said, hey, he, he, he's, he's a cousin. He's a, he's a kinsman, he's a kinsman redeemer. Yeah. Ruth is, uh, Naomi is thinking redemption, redeemer all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, so um, go to the next slide. Let's go back to our slides, uh, Sister Deidre. Yes, there is a gentleman that has his mic open. Probably we need to close it. He's the one doing the doing the flats. That better not be my brother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, conclusion, conclusion, the story of Ruth, a Hebraic perspective. Oh, okay, think about all that we said about the story of Ruth. Uh, Sister Deidre, can everybody mute their mics right now, please? Because I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of talking. So um, Boaz is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. This is where we get into Hebraic school. Boaz is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. And how is that? He covered a Ruth like like Jesus covers uh, covers us with his blood. He redeemed her. Mm -hmm. You know, when when we were lost in our sins, you know, the blood of Jesus redeemed us and put us back in relationship with the father. He protected her. Someone said he didn't want her gleaming in anybody else's field because the men, you you know, stay away from uh, the men may fall on her. 
he paid the price. Uh, Boaz paid the price to purchase the, for the, the, the forfeited inheritance, just like Jesus paid the price to buy us back to God. So uh, they say that Boaz is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. Naomi is a type and shadow of the house of Judah, while Ruth is a type and shadow of the house of Israel. Now, we don't have time to go into all of that, but if you read 2 Kings, uh, first and second Kings, you'll see how the two houses of Israel were, were, were divided with Israel in the northern kingdom and Judah in the southern uh, kingdom. So Naomi is a type and shadow of the house of Judah and the Holy Spirit. The, the house of Judah, because she was, she was a, a native Israelite, uh, and of the Holy Spirit, because we've all talked about how she led Ruth, how she taught Ruth, uh, teaching and instruction. She instructed Ruth, how she guided Ruth. You know, uh, uh, we, you, you know, she she did that thing. She led, she led Ruth. Like the Holy Spirit leads us into things that are better for us, not into the, not into uh, uh, destruction, but He leads us. Uh, in, in, into better ways and better things. Now, how is uh, Ruth a type and shadow of the house of Israel? Because uh, it, uh, uh, the house of Israel is the one, the uh, northern house. Israel is the northern house. Judah is the southern house. Israel, the northern house, is the one that went into captivity under the Assyrians. And, and this will take another lesson. That's where the 10 lost tribes were. Well, Ruth, it's not uh, an Israelite. Ruth is a, a, was a Gentile from the land of uh, Moab, but she comes in to the Torah of the teaching and the instruction. I'm still on the side. Thank you. Uh, she comes in on the teaching and the instruction of, of, of Naomi, who, who is an example of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to chew on that a while for it to make sense. Uh, right down also Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones, and Ezekiel uh, uh, 37, it, it speaks of the union of the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Hebrews 8 and 8 talks about the covenant with both houses, the house of Israel and the house of, 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 uh, of, of Judah. So these two houses have come together, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, Ruth and Naomi have come together to make uh, what the Bible refers to as one new man, as one house, as one house. It says, Oprah is a type and shadow of the Gentile church that'll turn its back on Israel and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the last days. Moab is a type and shadow of Egypt. So Egypt is anything outside of the realm of of the blessings. If you're not under the rim of the blessings, then you're in Egypt. And Moab was a type and shadow of Egypt. Uh, the story of Ruth is about God's redemptive plan to redeem those outside of the Torah or outside of his teachings and instructions to redeem them back to himself, to join the two houses together, Israel and Judah, and to save them through our Messiah, Jesus Christ, that's in uh, Matthew 1 and 16. So the story of Ruth is about the redemptive plan of God, how he takes two houses, Judah and Israel, and brings them back together. And, uh, and they're all going to be under the, the, the leadership of, they're all going to be safe under the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Tom, the one that wouldn't buy the land, I added him to the list, is the type and shadow of the Antichrist. He, uh, he will sit at the gate, the, end, the end Christ will sit at the gate of authority and pretend to care. He'll pretend to be a redeemer, but he re really isn't one. So they say he's a type and shadow of, of uh, the Antichrist. So in conclusion, the genealogy of Jesus is the whole house of Jacob. And anytime you read in the Bible about the house of Jacob, it's referred to the house of Israel and the house of Judah coming together as one. When they come together as one, then they are the house of Jacob. The Jews under Boaz and the Gentiles under the Ruth coming together as one, and it's through their lineage that our Messiah comes. Next slide. The end. <laughs> 
I know that last slide might have been a little bit to chew off of, but uh, study it. Uh, if you read Second Kings and, and uh, uh, the, the books of uh, First and Second Kings, you'll see all of the history about the two houses, how they were separated, and how it was always in God's redemption. You can remove that slide, Sister Deeper. It was always in God's redemptive plan that Jesus would come and that he would be the ransom for the sins of all of the nations, not just in Israel, but all of the nations, even the Moabites, the Muslims, all of them, his blood was shed for mankind. And this, my friend, is what the book of Ruth depicts. Any thoughts? Because before we go, is Sister Charlotte still there? Charlotte, are you there? Your speaker is not working. Can y'all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, okay. Where did Charlotte go? She had to reconnect. She got dropped off. She's coming right back. Okay. So, any thoughts about uh, particular uh, about the last uh, slide or anything about the story of the Book of Ruth? Hopefully, when you read the Book of Ruth uh, from now on, you know you. Hopefully, you have gained some type of insight into the book of Ruth. And when you read it, you'll see more than, you know, what's on the, what, than what's on the pages. I love the fact that um, Ruth, Naomi was her mentor, but Ruth, she, mm -hmm. um, she was obedient because each time she told her something to do, she followed her instructions and never wavered. And that lets me know that um, when she said she would worship her God and her God would be her God, that's mm -hmm. what she meant. It meant a good faith yeah. and she was mm -hmm. obedient to God. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, and, I, and, Amen. I, and I love uh, the fact that um, versus the last one, chapter four verses four through 15 mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it, and when it said then the woman said to naomi blessed is the lord mm -hmm. who has not left you without a redeemer today mm -hmm. he is a redeemer he is a restorer mm -hmm. and he is a sustainer mm -hmm. and if you don't get anything after just know that god he he will take when you hear the scripture he'll take back what the locust and i say it's just a try to steal because he can re, he can restore it back and give mm -hmm. you back everything that even better if you mm -hmm. read the story of Job, you know he had beautiful children and, and, and uh, lots of flock but then when he went through what he went through mm -hmm. god blessed him mm -hmm. even more mm -hmm. than he was the first time. So if nothing else, he's a redeemer, he's a restorer, and he is a sustainer. Amen. 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 And that's why, it, and that's why in the Hebraic circle, they teach that Boaz is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, because mm -hmm. that's exactly what he did. He served mm -hmm. as the redeemer. He wasn't even in line to be the redeemer, mm -hmm. but the one that was in line, you know, uh, didn't didn't take didn't bite mm -hmm. so uh yeah. but it was always in god's plan and one thing we said in the background that the theme the theme of the book of ruth is redemption it occurs mm -hmm. 23 times in the book mm -hmm. and it shows how god is working out his redemptive plan of salvation god mm -hmm. god i believe it was in god's plan that ruth and boaz and then in the rabbinical literature it says five generations after them you know that they, they were all godly men they were all they were all mm -hmm. godly men so uh, maybe that's why tove didn't make the cut you know mm -hmm. it wasn't it wasn't for yeah, him to make the cut. that's right that's right <laughs> because god knew god knew they didn't know but god knew that david would come through that lineage mm -hmm. and 42 Amen. generations later jesus would come through that lineage mm -hmm. and uh uh, look at how God brought a Jew and a Gentile together, mm -hmm. you know, to start to start that lineage of the Messiah. <laughs> oh, Sister and Charlotte, you're back. Uh, Sister Mary Jane, we'll hear from you. And then uh, we don't want to go without hearing our songbird. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Mary Jane, go ahead. I just like the fact, too, that it's a pretty love story. Because yeah. it started in the beginning where the women were struggling. They were on their own again. She was bitter. The, the two uh, daughter-in-laws were trying to decide what to do. They didn't have the, the covering of a man. But toward the very end, God restored everything. We know he's our covering. We know Amen. that. Amen. But it's great to have that physical man 
also covering and putting up. Uh, uh, you like you said, somebody cut the yard, somebody to do this. It's nice. To have that. Uh, so, and then the fact that Naomi at the end was happy, no longer bitter, no yes. longer feeling bad, and mm -hmm. holding her little baby and just yes. her grandchild, really, yes. and just having that peace. And who can give us that peace? But the Lord. Jesus. So it's a good, it's a good story. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, turn it over. I'm not the host, but where are you at, host? We're going to turn. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'm here. Can you all hear me? I just, I'm sorry. I just, I just got these headphones working again. I'm, oh, mm -hmm. praise the Lord. Uh, this is a little song that I absolutely love called, you know, my name, Tasha Cobbs. Mm -hmm. uh, Litter has this song, and it just sounds like something I would have grown up that I grew up on. So that this blesses you like it blesses me. It's my personal song of the Lord. It's okay. Thank you, Lord. You know my name. You know my name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, how you walk with me. Oh, how you talk with me. Oh, how you tell me that I am your own. Huh. The song that I thought Hallelujah. I would share with you all day. Thank you, Lord. 
because of because when you said you were coming Hallelujah. Home, Hallelujah. I thought Hallelujah. about how the Holy Spirit is a counselor <coughs> and how God guided through Naomi and that type and shadow of the Holy Spirit. That song just Amen. always back there. So. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Share that link for everyone. The original Amen. song so that you can have Amen. that in your um, in your in your your quiet time with the Lord. It's a beautiful song. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Well, Amen. Amen. Let's uh, give Sister Charlotte a, a hand praise. Amen. Let's give, give Sister Charlotte a hand praise for being Amen. with us today. Amen. And Amen. for bringing that beautiful song, You Know beautiful. My Name. Sure mm -hmm. does. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate that. that Oh, okay. you're welcome um, i have your email address now sister charlotte you're gonna get it you're gonna get invited to all we meet every two saturdays yeah, yeah. every every other saturday we meet unless it's a holiday and we let you all know in advance mm -hmm. uh sister ricky you want to tell them again because uh, some of them have not logged on yet what the next session is absolutely the next session is going to be on june the 20th